everyone. So today I want to share a special word with you. I'm going to actually revisit a word that I've spoken once um, with some things that I think the Lord has put in my heart for this season for us as a ministry. Uh, maybe there is somebody out there who can relate to what I'm going to share. I, I believe there is because as I was preparing for this morning, the Lord brought me back to this word and it was a, just a, a convicting word for me. It was, a, it was a word of conviction. And so I want to ask us to open up our hearts and be receptive to whatever God wants to speak to us. And if it is a little bit of a kick in the pants to you, that's okay. Sometimes it's good to have that kick in the pants to recalibrate us and get us back on the track that we're supposed to be in. Um, so I want to talk to you about being at a certain point in life and those who maybe feel like I have that you expected to be somewhere different than where you are now, right? You expected that you would be somewhere farther along than you are right now. Anybody? Or is it just me? Everybody. Where are you right now in life? Let me ask that question in general. Where are you in life right now? Now I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Is that where you thought you would be at this point in your life? Or did you think you would be further down the road in some area? Okay, me too. All right, cool. Now that we've established that, I want to talk to you about embracing the process. Embrace the process. And that's the title of my message today. Because many times God gives us a promise, but he omits the fact that there will be a process to get to that promise. So we just hear the promise, right? Joseph, like I'm going to talk about here in a couple minutes, he's a perfect example of someone who was given a promise but the details of the process that it would take to get him to the promise were left out, right? Because when he had the dream about the grain, the veils of grain bowing down to him and the stars bowing down, there was nothing in that dream about him being sold as a slave. There was nothing in that dream about him being falsely accused. There was nothing in that dream about him being thrown into a pit, but that was part of the process to get him to the promise. And so I want to highlight quickly a couple other things that require a process in life. How about this? What is the best part of every birthday? The presence. The Some say the presence. They're not uh, as focused on their stomach as I am. The best part, obviously, of every birthday is the birthday cake. But how many know that you can't just snap your fingers and a cake appears, right? I mean, there's Uber Eats and there's all this stuff you can order. But if you want to make like an authentic homemade, delicious, three-layer cake. You have to bake it. There are some steps in the process that you have to go through in order to get a cake. It's not just you snap your fingers and the cake is there, right? If you were to take all of the ingredients that you need for a cake and throw them into a mixing bowl and just mix it and put it in the oven, it's not good. You have to have it in order, right? There's a process to it. There are certain ingredients that have to go into this cake to get it to rise, once the cake rises, right, you're checking the moisture level. Like if you really know what you're doing, there's a lot that you have to do in order to be able to get the cake to look and taste the way you ultimately want it to taste, right? And there's, there's, there's another step to it. Once the cake comes out, who likes cake with no icing? Disgusting, blah. The icing is the best part of a cake. So there's ingredients and a process to getting the cake to look and taste the way you want it to look and taste. How about another thing, the weight loss process, right? Has anyone ever been down that journey? I've been down and back at least 15 times, right? Because it seems like it's something that I've had to do many times in my life where I get to a certain level, a certain weight that I'm, I'm not healthy. And so I start implementing all these things. But you don't just snap your fingers and the weight is gone. Even if you have liposuction, like even if you go the surgery route, there's still ramifications. There's still a process to that. There's still a process of recovery that has to take place. But if you want to healthily lose weight, there's a process. It starts with altering your diet, not completely drastically changing your diet because that won't be sustainable. You alter your diet little by little. You start removing certain things and adding certain certain things to your diet to become healthier. Then you incorporate exercise in small doses. Don't start right away just running sprints, right? Don't start right away trying to run a 5K. You have to ease into it. But there is a process. I've lost 50 pounds since the beginning of this year. Since January 1st, I've lost 50 pounds. Much of that was due to medical ramifications that would have happened if I hadn't lost that weight, if I hadn't changed my diet, started seeing a holistic uh, uh, functional medicine doctor. And he said, look, you've got to change the way you're living. 
I had a lot of things that were out of whack. My cardiovascular system, my thyroid, I've been on, I had been on up until that point, thyroid medicine for years. Synthroid, I was, I was taking it because my thyroid was underact, all these things. And so he said, your bill of health right now looks like that of somebody twice your age, an unhealthy person twice your age. You should not be having these issues at this age. He said, so there's two options. Number one, we can just medicate you, right? We can put you on all this medication to bring all your levels down. And, and I started seeing a cardiologist. She said, your heart rate's way too high. We need to put you on medicine and bring that down. Or you can drastically, you can, listen, start the process of changing your lifestyle. It's a process. So I said, well, I vote that because I don't want to be on medicine for the rest of my life. So I started changing my diet, started leaving certain things out. Inflammatory foods, a thing of the past. Cut out caffeine. For, for those of you who know me, cutting out caffeine was a miracle. That was right up there with the resurrection. I mean, it was, that, that was a miracle for me to be able to cut out caffeine. But I did it. And now what are we in, June? Yeah. We're in June now. So we're nearly six months into the year of this process that I've started. Like I said, I've dropped 50 pounds. I've been exercising. I'm getting ripped, people. I haven't been like this since I was in high school. I'm looking at myself like, is this the same person? Why? Because I started one step of the process. See, it starts with one step and then another step and then another step. But you only count the one step, right? That's all you got to worry about. Just focus on the one step. And today I've had multiple follow-up doctor's appointments my levels are perfect. My thyroid is in perfect health. My cardiovascular system is working perfectly. My heart rate came way down. So the doctor said, there's no need for any medicines. Just keep doing what you're doing. It works. It's just a matter of will we go through the process? So many people given the same choice that I was given would have opted in for the medicine route because it's so much easier. Keep eating whatever you want to eat. Keep doing whatever you want to do. Keep living the unhealthy lifestyle you want to live and just take this pill. And it's easy, right? But the process isn't always easy. And the same is true of travel, right? If you want to go take a, a transatlantic flight, you want to go to Egypt, you want to go to somewhere in Africa, you want to go to Europe, you want, it's a long way to get there. You don't just blink your eyes and you're transported to these places. If that were the case, there'd be a lot more international travel. But you actually have to... Get up, pack your suitcase, get a taxi to the airport, have a friend take you to the airport, ride the little trolley from one terminal to the next, right? After you've checked your bags in, when you get there, you got to make sure that your, your, your carry-on fits into that unrealistically small template that they give you or else they're going to charge you $350. Like, there's a process to travel. Why is it that we can understand and we can believe and we can acknowledge and we can accept that there is a process to everything else in life, but when it comes to God, we expect it instantly? Yeah. Or we just want to disregard God's promises and say, well, he must not have known what he was talking about when he gave me that promise because it hasn't happened yet. It's called a process. So today, again, the title of my message is Embrace the Process. You know, another people group that was given a promise without really being told the entire process were the Israelites, right? They were given a massive promise to their father Abraham that they would inherit the promised land, that they would be given the nations of the world, that they would be given a land that was flowing with milk and honey, all of these wonderful things. But then something happened. Let's pick up, actually, before we jump to our text, the Bible says that there was a man named Moses, who was born during a time of persecution to the Israelites. And in an effort to save him, because a decree had been issued to kill all the firstborn sons of the children of Israel, his mother put him into a basket and he, he, he floated down the river, right? And we know the story. Pharaoh's daughter picked him up. He became a prince of Egypt. But there was a call of God on his life. And I'm here to tell you that there might be a call of God on your life that looks different than what you're doing. It may not be as comfortable as what you're doing, but when the call of God is on your life, you cannot fight it. There will be a time when that call will be activated. You may be in a time of training. You may be in a season of preparation, but the time will come. And so this man, Moses, was called to deliver the Israelites who at that time were slaves in Egypt into freedom, into the promised land. And that was the call of God that was on his life. But the Bible says that the people were stubborn. Moses himself was stubborn. Because if you actually read in the book of Exodus, he argues with God 
back and forth through Exodus chapter three and Exodus chapter four, when God calls him, he confronts, or God confronts him at this burning bush where God is actually speaking to Moses from the bush. Can you imagine speaking to God, speaking to the creator of the universe in which Moses is arguing with God saying, God, you don't know who you're talking to. I'm not good with words. What if they don't listen to me? As, as a burning bush is speaking to him. Let that sink in for a moment. He says, who am I? Or who are you? And God says, I am that I am. That's who you're going to tell them sent you. He's speaking to the creator of the universe. And he said, I am Yahweh, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Bible says that Moses covered his face in fear. So in that moment, he was aware that he was speaking to the creator of the universe. Don't miss this. Yet he was telling him all of his shortcomings. I can't do it. How could, I, how could I do that? I'm not good with words. We protest God so many times when God is telling us, I'm going to be with you. Look, this whole deal, this whole setup, I created it. God created it. And that's what he's telling you. I created everything that is. How can you not trust that I would be with you in this trial that you're facing, in the process Right, But Moses was too stubborn. He argued with God, so God said, fine, take your brother-in-law Aaron. I'll speak through him. Let us all, hear me today, let us not argue with God so that he has to choose another to do what he desires to empower us to do. It doesn't matter how crazy it looks. It doesn't matter how far-fetched it seems. God has given you a plan and a purpose for you to accomplish Therefore, it's his job to give you the tools that you need to see it through. Joshua 5, verse 6. The children of Israel. So the Bible says, backing up for a moment, that Moses took them out of Egyptian bondage. They wandered around in the desert. After they had seen signs, wonders, and miracles, they wandered around in the wilderness because they were too stubborn. They complained, I don't want to be that way. And the Lord was convicting me this week about that. I don't want to complain and, and, and murmur and say, God, you said this, but it hasn't happened. Lord, even right now, God, just change my heart, Lord, that I would not be a complainer. Can we all pray that right now? God, remove a complaining spirit out of us, Lord, that even if we don't understand it, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's miserable, even if the enemy is closing in on us and all we see is a sea in front of us, help us to not limit you with our lack of faith. We choose to believe today that you have our best interests because we don't want to be like Moses who forfeited the calling, God. We want to be like Joshua who picked up the calling. In Jesus' name, amen. So Joshua 5, 6, for the children of Israel walked for 40 years in the wilderness till all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers he would give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So there you go. They were supposed to see the land. They didn't see the land. So here comes this new leader. God will always fulfill his plan. Hear me today. See, his plan is not contingent upon your obedience. Your role in his plan is contingent upon your obedience. I want you to think about that perspective for a minute. His plan will be fulfilled with or without you. His plan was for Moses to lead the Israelites, the ones who ended up actually never even making it. The original group was supposed to inherit and possess the land that was flowing with milk and honey, but they didn't. However, God's plan went through anyway. So he'll establish his promise through something else. Let that not, let, through someone else. Let that not be the case for me or for you. Let him establish his plan through us. Amen? Amen. So we have to embrace the process. How do we do that? How do we embrace the process? Joshua 1, 1 through 9. We're going to look at the text and look at the example of Joshua. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. Now, think about that for a minute. As I said to Moses. So, here are two men that are being given the same instructions with the same promise. 
One just chooses to believe the word of God. See, it comes back to faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to do what God has called you to do. You hear me today? From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all of the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Someone needs to hear that again. I will not leave you nor forsake you. And let me back up just a little bit more in verse five. No man, and I would add no demon, no force of darkness, no person, no agenda shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. When God is for you, who can be against you? Nothing can stand in the way of what God wants to accomplish. So I have to remind myself of that as I sit here in my living room after standing in front of a crowd of over a thousand people preaching the gospel, right? God told us to leave that. And I have to remind myself that if he told us to leave that for this, he has a purpose for this. He has a reason for this. He's going to do something with this. If I will maintain and we as a team will maintain the right attitude. That doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. That's not going to, that doesn't mean we're not going to have days where we look at each other like I did to me and my wife this past week and say, what the freak are we doing? That's the edited version. I don't use profanity in my house. What the heck are we doing? What did God call us to do? Did we miss it? Like that, that's a regular thing. But we have to remember that the Israelites probably had the same questions, probably even more so than us. But God said, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Lord, that's all I want. If you're with me and we don't ever really do anything significant and humanize, that's fine. As long as I know that you're with me. But look at this next part. This is where there's a mandate that's then put on us. Be strong and of good courage. For this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Wait, didn't he just say that? Why did he say it twice? Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book, the law, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. It does not say, for then I will make your way prosperous, and then I will give you good success. Does it? Let me read it again. For then who? You, right? For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So what does that tell us? There's a formula to success and prosperity. It's called obedience. Let me back up because it's so good. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do. Everybody say do. Do. Type it in the chat. Do. Do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. So, so if we don't have good success and our way is not prosperous, that's on us because there's a promise here. If we do what he told us to do in his word, if we fulfill and obey what he has given us to do, the instruction, our way will be prosperous and we will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I'm here to tell somebody watching right now, the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So that means tomorrow when you're in the cubicle and the person next to you is snoring wide awake and they're driving you nuts and that boss of yours (laughs) is coming and giving you an assignment that is so unrealistic, whatever the case may be, 
you can have courage knowing that he is with you. Don't be afraid or dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go when you're riding in the car and the enemy wants to take you out in a car wreck. We've had several car wrecks in our family that should have been really bad and God has kept us because the angel of the Lord is with us wherever we go. And the angel of God, when you are his child, when you are living a life that is submitted to him, he will command his angels to be encamped around you to keep the hand of the enemy from destroying you the way the devil wants to destroy you. He can't do it because the Lord, your God is with you wherever you go. And I just feel like I have to hammer that into someone's head today. God is with you. God is with you. God is with you. I silence that lying voice of the enemy that says that God has left you alone. The Bible is full of promises that he would not leave us nor forsake us. Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the earth. He is with you now, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're feeling. Oh, be encouraged today by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is with you. Ah, he is not against you. So as my first point says, given that knowledge, be strong and courageous today. Be strong and courageous in the revelation that God is with you. Without God, you can't be strong. Without God, you have no courage, but with God, With God, you can be strong and courageous knowing that he is right there with you wherever you go. Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's a commandment. He commands us. In fact, he tells Joshua in that one text three times, three times, Why does God have to reiterate it three times? Because if he's telling us to be strong and of good courage, is it possible that we will face obstacles that will challenge our courage and our strength? Will we not face obstacles that will deplete us of our joy, that will try and take every bit of strength that we have, every bit of joy that we have out of us, but we have to be strong. It's not an option. It's not a matter of feeling. It's a matter of obedience. And that word I just read is that if you want success and if you want to to see the hand of God move in your life, if you want to be prosperous, you have to be obedient. But we don't think of being courageous as being obedient. We think about God, give me courage. God's saying, no, possess courage. Take courage and be obedient in doing so. So that tells me that we don't get the option to sit by and have a pity party. We don't get the option to just wallow and complain and God, how am I going to do this? We have to be strong and courageous as an act of obedience. Are you hearing? Is what I'm saying getting across to you today? Because so often we don't think about a lack of courage as disobedience. We think about a lack of courage as, oh, someone needs to come boost me up. Lord, boost me up. And God may be looking from heaven at you as you pray, God, encourage me, saying, encourage yourself. Like my servant David, who was in the cave. And the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. It doesn't say that an angel came down and the cave filled up with light. And that so encouraged him because he was made aware of the nearness and the proximity of God. It says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes we have to encourage ourselves as an act of obedience to God because he said, be strong and of good courage. So Lord, today, right now, I don't know how many times I'm going to stop and pray in the middle of my message, but I just feel like it's for me. So right now I encourage myself in the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. I feel the glory of God in this room right now. I encourage myself in the Lord and I ask for forgiveness, God, for allowing discouragement to govern my life. I ask for forgiveness, God, for allowing discouragement to take over, God. And I say no today. I possess the encouragement that is mine. I possess the courage. I possess the strength that is mine today. No one has to give it to me. I take it by force now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And as I do that, I feel the courage of God. I feel the peace of God. I feel, yeah, the strength of God. Right now, take it. Take it by force. Take it by faith, whoever's watching this. It's yours. Be courageous in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Speak it out of your mouth. Say, I receive the courage of God. 
I receive the strength of God. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, have your way in this moment. We're not in a rush. We're not in a rush. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Speak to your people right now in the name of Jesus. Do a deep work that only you can do right now prophetically, God. We don't have to wait till the end of this service. Do it now, God. Right now, begin to unlock. I see these layers of, of, of just like a safe, all these cogs of things, and God's unlocking one layer at a time. This is the first layer. You gotta stop with the self-pity. You gotta stop with the wallowing in despair and get out of it now. Now, stand up. You may not feel like it, but if you need to physically stand up wherever you're watching from right now, stand up and start speaking out of your mouth. Say, I renounce discouragement. I renounce depression. I renounce sadness in the name of Jesus. I renounce anxiety and worry, and I possess the courage of God. <coughs> I possess the strength of God. I possess the joy of God. It's mine. I'm not waiting for somebody to give it to me. I take it now by faith and by force in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're doing. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Wow, I feel the power of God, man. Ooh. Have your way, Lord. Just come. Mm, wreck it. Do what you want to do. Just throughout, throughout the message, we're just going to stop as the Lord prompts me. We're not going to force anything, but as God prompts me to just start speaking things out, I just feel like something prophetic is happening in someone's life right now. You've been discouraged. You've been looking at where you wanted to be. And, and look, milestones and calendars and, and Gantt charts, all of those things are great. We need those things to stay organized. But sometimes we look at where we thought we would be and we're not there, and that can become a source of discouragement. But I want to tell you, the steps of a righteous person are ordered of the Lord. So if you are living a life in surrender to him, don't be discouraged by the missed milestone. Because I'm telling you, it's not missed. Everything that you do is in the perfect timing of God. So rest in that today. If you are striving, I'm not talking about those who are laying on the couch with a bag of Fritos, not doing anything, okay? Get your butt off the couch and get to work. I'm talking about the ones who are pushing and striving and praying and, and, and worrying and God, how is this gonna happen? Those who are pushing for something that you haven't seen happen yet, you've pushed. That means your part is done. Now rely on God for the timing. Amen. Amen. Another person who went through a process that I talked about in the sermon, actually, um, that was aired last Sunday, it was from a couple of months, a few months back, I guess more than that now when I, when I preached it, but originally, but I talked about Joseph, right? His, bio, his um, life was actually a massive process that he had to go through. You know, the Bible says that he, he was sold into Egyptian slavery. He was a slave, right? He was taken to Egypt. He was sold. All of these different things that he had to go through. He was thrown into a pit. He was then sold. He then went to Potiphar's house, which many times we have like a little detour and we can think Potiphar's house is the promise. Don't get comfortable in a good situation that's actually not the promise of God because then you forfeit being second to only Pharaoh. Are you hearing me this morning? Somebody needs to hear that today. You may be in a good situation. You may even have an offer for a really good situation that you can take at any moment, right? Like Potiphar's house. He could have easily slept with Potiphar's wife and kept that gig going for however long. But he knew, no, 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 I have to be faithful. I have to be faithful. So, so it may look like the promise. It may be disguised as the promise. But be sure before you stop and settle in that it is the promise. Because what happened? Step four was the prison cell, right? From Potiphar's house, from glamour, from all of these things to the prison cell. Step five was then finally the promise when he became ruler over all of Egypt. But him fulfilling the promise by going through the process did not just affect him, but it affected everyone in the surrounding regions of that time because there was a famine and there was a man who needed to be in a prison cell at a certain time to interpret the dream of a butler 
in order for the word to get back to Pharaoh about the dream that was tormenting him that was ultimately God speaking about what was gonna happen to all of mankind at that time in that region. So I'm here to tell you the promise is so big and it's not just for you. It's for those who are around you. Do not circumvent the process because the process is the only thing that will lead you to the promise. Number two, be a carrier of God's presence. Be a carrier of God's presence. Even in the grocery store, when somebody cuts you off in the parking lot, you're trying to get in, right? Someone rams into your cart and doesn't say, excuse me. We were at Costco yesterday. I don't know what possessed us to go to that place on a Saturday. It was ridiculous. And there were multiple times where I had to remind myself, I'm a carrier of God's presence. I'm a carrier of God's presence. I'm a carrier of God's wrath. I mean, God's presence. I'm a carrier of God's presence. And I had to remind myself of that because Costco on a Saturday is a recipe for a trial of your salvation. Like if you want to test and see how saved you are, go to Costco on a Saturday. I actually don't recommend it at all. It was horrible. People rammed their carts into my ankles multiple times. And uh, the Lord had to sanctify me when we left that place. Charlie's nodding his head yes, because he can, he can understand and agree with what I'm saying. So number, number two, be a carrier of God's presence. Being a carrier of God's presence opens the door to supernatural intervention, right? Because God's presence is supernatural. Can't see it, but we know it's here. It's a supernatural entity. God is a supernatural being, So what happens? Our proximity to the supernatural being that is Jesus Christ through the form of the Holy Spirit opens us up to supernatural activity in our lives. The closer we are to Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the more he is working through us, the more we will see the hand of God work in our lives in supernatural means. And I know I just lost some people there because that sounds like pie in the sky kind of frou-frou things. Listen, I've seen it enough times to know it's not coincidence. I've seen the hand of God supernaturally show up on our behalf enough times. I'll just give you one story that you've probably heard before if you follow my preaching of a time when Hurricane George in the early 90s came and swept through the Dominican Republic, destroyed the island. We were living there at the time. It was very frightening to be there while this was happening. And there was a village that we were ministering in where the road had been overtaken by a river. And so nobody could get in or out of the village. Now the water subsided, but it, they were still about three to four feet high, probably about three feet high. And, and, and on one side was this river and on the other side of the road was a, was a drop off a ravine about 20 feet down where there was a waterfall. And, and we were driving our vehicle to bring fresh water to the people because they had no way of getting fresh water to that village. And we made it through just fine. We took the fresh water, but then on our way out, we had already been threatened by witch doctors. They had threatened our lives saying, get out of here. You know, because when we first came to visit that village, they were fine with us until they found out that we were staying and planning a church. Then they wanted us out of there. They would come and throw rocks at our crusades. They were, it, was, it, was, it was a very hostile environment to minister. But it didn't stop my parents. I thank God for their tenacity, their faith, and their courage yes. to continue doing what God had told them to do because today it's a massive ministry down there that feeds over 800 children a day gives food and, and, and medication and above all, a Christian education, over 800 children a day in that same town where they tried to, to, to kill us and get rid of us. There's a water purification plant. The church is now the town center where all of the government uh, uh, policies are set and where all of these things take place, where the mayor of the town comes to issue decrees. Like, the very place where they said they didn't want a church almost 25 years later is now the center of that town and the town revolves around the church. There's actually two of our campuses in that town because of the faithfulness and the courage and the strength of my parents sticking it out even after five years when not one adult would get saved and only children would come to our meetings. They stuck it out. They were faithful. And I thank God to this day for my parents and their obedience because thousands of lives have been changed in that nation because of it. But on this particular day, there was no water purification plant. There was no uh, church there. There was nothing. 
and we were going to bring fresh water. On our way back from bringing fresh water, the villagers ambushed us and came out and started pushing our vehicle over the ravine, over the ravine in the river, or toward the ravine rather, and the vehicle began to, 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 to skid. The tires were skidding toward this ravine. And, and people were completely surrounding the vehicle. There was no way we could get out of the situation that we were in without running over people. And so as my dad is trying to make a decision, am I gonna run over these people that were coming to minister to to save my family from falling into this ravine? My mom began praying. I would say praying just to be gracious, but it was more screaming than praying <laughs> and calling on the name of Jesus. Jesus, I'll never forget it. And I'm like, what's happening right now as an 11 year old kid. And in that very moment, the mayor of the town just so happened to be on the same road, which by the way is desolate. There's, there's not much going on out in that road that leads out of the village, pulls up behind our vehicle. His bodyguards get out and start shooting rounds in the air to scare the people. As soon as they start shooting off these gunshots, everybody takes off running at the very moment we needed intervention. Coincidence? Maybe, maybe, if it was just that one time. But if I had hours, not even hours, but days, I would tell you so many other stories just like that one, where our brakes went out in the very same vehicle when we were coming down a mountain. Mind you, there's no guardrails, right? You look down, it's 500 foot drop because it's a very mountainous terrain with no guardrails. And we're coming down this mountain on an incline and we, hear, we start to smell a burning smell and the brakes completely go out. My dad's pumping the brakes and we're all looking and we're like, this isn't good. We don't have brakes right now. And the vehicle somehow by supernatural intervention just slowed itself down and came to a complete stop. No brakes whatsoever. And we were able to pull off the side of the road and stop on some uh, rocky terrain that, were, that, that actually served to stop the vehicle. There was no way. There was no way it should have happened. Supernatural intervention. So we are now the carriers of God's presence. Look at Joshua 3, 5, and 8, right? And Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Why do we believe that God did wonders back then but can't do them now? I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever right? That's the God that I serve. Then Joshua spoke to the priests saying, take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, this day, I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel that they may know as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant saying, when you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was actually where the presence of God was embodied. He chose to dwell in the Ark of the Covenant. Today, we don't have an Ark of the Covenant. You know what the Ark of the Covenant is today? Me and you. Our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are carriers of the presence of God. So that means wherever we go, he goes. And that means that there are times that wherever he goes, we go, because the Holy Spirit will prompt us to go places and do things and say things that we weren't planning on going, saying, and doing, because we are living in communion with him. He is living inside of us, but there's a part here that's so important. We have to sanctify ourselves. See that? In the first part of the verse, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Our bodies are the new arcs of the covenant. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and whom you are, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Wow. We don't belong to ourselves. We were bought at a price. That means we have to treat this temple as what it is. And I'm gonna just step on some toes today because I have authority to do so. And I have a leg to stand on in this moment because for the last six months, I have been taking care of this temple like I have never done so in my life. And it's not just for the next six months either. I told my wife, I'm never going back. I'm never going back to the way that I was ever. We have to take care of this temple, not just 
as it relates to our spiritual health, but as our physical health as well. Because if we're not physically healthy, if we're not getting the rest that we need, we cannot accurately do the work that God has called us to do. If we're exhausted all the time because we're not sleeping like we're supposed to, how are we supposed to be effective for God? We're supposed to be vigilant, right? Let me put it to you this way. You wouldn't go into the house of God and smear mud all over the carpet, would you? You wouldn't go into the house of God and drop your fast food wrapper on the ground and leave your leftover drinks on the ground, right? We treat the house of God, the physical building, which is actually not his house at all, but we treat the physical brick and mortar building better than we treat the temple where he's actually living. The brick and mortar building can be torn down and a new one built, but wherever the people go is where the church is because we are carriers of his presence, That's why we're having church right here in my living room right now. So let's not treat a building better than we treat the holy temple of the Holy Spirit. This temple is holy. We have to treat it as such. So that means not eating junk all the time. That means not uh, uh, abusing our body by forcing ourselves to stay up late and getting up early. We need to do what we need to do to treat this temple with respect right? And not, and not desecrate it in any way. But that also brings up the next part of this, which is, is that God has called us to be a holy temple. So, so I want to talk about spiritual holiness, spiritual health, right? The things that we watch, the things that we listen to, the things that we allow into our home, the things that we talk about with one another, Let our talk not be perverse, but let it be wholly acceptable, right? Some of the things that we force the Holy Spirit to watch through our eyes is disheartening to me. And I I used to be guilty of it. I had no filter, even as a Christian, even as somebody in ministry, I would watch any movie that you put in front of me with any kind of profanity. I had no filter and the Holy Spirit convicted me and said, when you watch those things, how can I be present with you? The Lord spoke that to me years ago. How can I be present with you? The essence of our God is holiness. He's pure. He's undefiled. And we force him as the temple to hear profanity, to watch the filth, to engage in in dialogue that's not suitable. We do that. But then when that happens, he cannot be present during that interaction, during that inter- exchange. So if we are to be temples of the Holy Spirit, we have to sanctify ourselves. Like Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Maybe you're feeling convicted right now about some of the things that you've watched, said, done, thought, listened to. I want to give you an opportunity at the end of this message, stick around to the end, to pray a prayer of repentance and a prayer of sanctification a prayer of salvation, that if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he will come in and sanctify you. He will come in and purify your life. All you have to do is invite him to do so. Amen. So as I close today, the last point of my message is we have to stay focused. We have to stay focused. And this one is for me because God gave us a promise that that Circle Church would be a multinational church, all of these incredible things that God has spoken through his servants. Prophecies have come forth about Circle Church. And I'm like, Lord, I don't know how to make it happen. And the Lord said, it's not your job to make it happen. So I just have to trust and believe, okay, God, even if we only have 15 people watching our live stream right now, we're trying to be obedient. It doesn't make sense to me what we're doing. It doesn't make sense. I have so many plans and so many ideas of what it could look like and what it could be and how we could grow it. And God has not released us to do any of them. And so I'm just having to trust that he knows what he's doing. He's got a purpose. So I have to, you have to, we have to, everyone has to stay focused. Stay focused. Joshua 6, 1 through 5. This is when the children of Israel finally got to the place, the promised land, the ultimate trial. It says, now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, 
See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, you all men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. I want to pause right there. Team, we might be three days into this. We might be four days into this. We might be five days into this. I don't know how many days we're into this, but we're marching around the wall right now. Oh, I feel the power of God so strong. I feel the power of God so strong right now in this room. Speak, Holy Spirit. Mm. Speak, Holy Spirit. I don't know what day we are on as a team as we march around this wall, but we are marching around the wall with a promise. We're not marching around the wall without a promise. We're marching around the wall with a promise. So Lord, we trust, we trust. You gave us a promise, Lord, so we'll continue to walk. We'll continue to walk. You shall march around the city, all you men, and I would add women of valor, of war, you shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. I don't know where you find yourself in the walk, but I'm going to preach a whole message on the walk. I know that may even be a series of messages, but I, this moment is so holy and sacred, what God is speaking right now. The walk, the march. I don't know where you are in the march. Maybe you're on the seventh day. You're on the sixth round. I don't know, but don't give up. I just feel in my spirit to tell somebody today, don't give up. Don't give in. Because just like Moses, just like the previous generation did, they could have given up. They could have given up. They said, this is too hard. This is too difficult. Why haven't the walls fallen yet? Don't give up. Hold on to the promise. And don't let the promise become a distraction either. Because many times we can look at the promise and say, well, there's got to be another way to the promise. No, 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 no. You're in process right now. Just do what God told you to do. God said, walk, walk. God said, march, march. God said, shout, shout. Whatever God said to do, no matter how long it's taking, do what God said to do. That's it. Just keep marching. Just keep marching. When we try and take the promise into our own hands, or I should say the process to the promise, we end up like Sarah who said, God gave us the promise of a son. He clearly didn't know what he was doing because my womb is all dried up. Abraham, come sleep with my servant. She got a version of the promise, a son for Abraham, but it wasn't the authentic promise. It wasn't what God had spoken that he would do. And I'm here to speak to some dry wombs right now. I'm here to speak to some desolate places where you have been told there is no possible way, your way too old. You're way too dried up. How could a son, how could a child, how could a dream, how could a vision possibly be birthed through you? God didn't know what he was talking about. And I hear the sly voice of the serpent saying, did God really say you can't eat from any fruit in the garden? Did God really say he was going to give you a son? 
And then that serpent says, well, you better make it happen because if not, you're living in disobedience. Oh. And that's what the devil will do. And that's what the devil's done with me. Make something happen quick because you're not being faithful with what God has entrusted to you. Make the promise happen before it's too late, before you're too old, before you miss out on the opportunity. Lord, I don't want to hear anyone else's voice but your voice. Let the spirit of truth triumph over the spirit of deception. Even the spirit of FOMO, fear of missing out. We don't want that. We want you, Jesus. We want you, Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace, everybody say grace. Type it in the chat, grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Through faith. We need courage, we need, courage, we need strength through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Listen. God will not let your efforts succeed because you're doing it in your own works. And then you would boast and you would get the glory. So every time I try and figure out how are we doing this, what are we doing, where are we going? Where are we going to plant a church? What are we going to do? God's like, it's not going to happen in your own works. And then you'll boast about it. Your head will get too big. And then you'll end up getting destroyed and falling and having some horrible thing happen to you. And God loves us too much to allow that to happen. So don't pray your will, pray God's will. Because your will may be God, promotion, promotion, success, success, success. There's a book that says, I thank God for all of the unanswered prayers. Because so often we pray not even knowing that what we're praying for and asking God for could be the very thing that destroys our family, the very thing that destroys us as people. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. So don't try and claim the promise by your own means. Just embrace the process. Even if you're on day one of the march. Even if you haven't even gotten to the march. Even if you're still stuck in Egypt. Wherever you are in the process, be at peace knowing that the promise still stands. The promise still stands. So what is the purpose for the process? What's the reason for all of this? Why couldn't God have just bypassed all of it and said, here you go, here's the promised land? Why does God put us through processes? Because the process is preparation for the promise. If God had given Joseph the promise before he went through the process that I preached about in the message last week, it would have destroyed him. He was a brat. Joseph, yes, he was a brat. He was prideful. He had a coat of many colors, which seems so appropriate for Pride Month. <laughs> I had to interject that. <laughs> right? But at the essence of even that agenda is pride. God despises the heart of the proud. Don't be prideful. Be humble. If the world's narrative is pride, the church's narrative should be humility. Let's celebrate humility while the world is celebrating pride. Because if we will remain humble and if we will keep our focus on God, he will elevate us at the right time. He will cause the promise to be fulfilled at the right time, but he won't do it when you're wearing your pride coat with many colors. He's got to wait until some things are done in your life through the process. Through the process. So embrace the process today. Can we do that? I want to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus right now as your Lord and Savior. If you've never done so before, I want you to repeat this simple prayer. Maybe you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you haven't been living a life that is worthy of housing his presence. A life that is worthy of hosting the Holy Spirit in this temple. 
I want to give you an opportunity to simply repent. If you pray this prayer, it's not about the words you speak. It's about the heart. God looks at the heart. If you mean this prayer from your heart, God will sanctify you. God will purify you. And his spirit will come to dwell inside of you today. So just repeat this prayer after me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I come humbly before you, acknowledging that I am a sinner in need of a savior. I ask you to wash me. I ask you to cleanse me. I ask you to humble me. I acknowledge that you are Lord and I am not. I ask that you would become my savior. I ask that you would remove everything from within me that is not of you. And that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. Oh yeah, say that again. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. As you pray that, he's filling you right now with his Holy Spirit. Let's just, just stay right here for a moment. Say it one more time. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. And evict everything that's not of you. Every spirit that is not of Jesus. Go now. In the name of Jesus, my Savior. Lord, I submit my life to you. To follow you every day. Until one day I am with you in heaven. And I worship you for all eternity. It's in your holy name I pray. Amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, we want to get to know you. Please send us a message on any of our social media platforms. You can send us a message right now at info at circlechurch.online. Type it in the chat. We want to get to know you. We want to help you along on this journey as you get to know Jesus. We love you so much here at Circle Church. We're on a journey right now, but I think it is going to be fun to look back at these videos when we are sitting here in my living room in years to come. You know why? Because today my, my, my spirit is encouraged because I'm reminded that the promise still stands. Even though we don't understand it, this is going to be some really good B-roll footage one day when we have thousands of people following our ministry and being saved and set free and delivered and touched. And when God is doing such incredible things for the ministry, we're going to look back on this video and be like, wow. And I think we're going to use it at one of our anniversary services one day. We're going to have this video playing on the screens, maybe at a location if we have it by then, if we're all online. We're going to play this video and we're going to look back on the day of small beginnings and we're going to know that we were faithful to not despise these moments, to not despise these seasons. God has great things in store for Circle Church. I prophesy we recalibrate ourselves today to be in alignment with the process of God. And we will see the promise of God through this ministry. We're not backing down. We will not be discouraged by the enemy, but we will continue to march on around the walls. And we know that they're coming down. That city is already ours. Those cities are already ours. Oh man, I feel the power of God in this room right now. Those cities that we are marching around that seem so fortified are already ours. This small group of people of less than 10, however many of us there are, God has great things in store. We will reach the multitudes for the cause of Christ, for the gospel of Jesus. Lives will be healed. Lives will be set free. Lives will be delivered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. And millions of dollars will be funneled into the kingdom of God through this ministry. You spoke it, God. You've spoken it for years from different servants of yours that millions of dollars would be funneled into this church and from this church into your kingdom, God. It's not going to stop here. It's going to be funneled into your work and into your kingdom all over the world. I prophesy it now in the name of Jesus. And this ministry will not just be a ministry where, 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 where finances are given, but it, it will be a ministry where finances are produced. Innovation will be birthed out of this ministry. Industries will be birthed out of this ministry. 
We will see the great end time harvest come through Circle Church. I prophesy it. In the name of Jesus. I seal it by the blood of Jesus Christ. Devil, I want you to hear the words coming out of my mouth right now. We will not back down. We will not give up. We will not give in. But we will continue to march on with the promise of God that Jericho is ours. The promised land is ours. The lost are found in Jesus' name. And they are saved by the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We thank you for it, God. In Jesus' name we pray and we agree. And everybody in agreement say amen. 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 We love you. We had to do a little bit of housekeeping, but we're glad you joined us anyway because God had to recalibrate some things as a group today, in us today, as a church today. But we're encouraged. And uh, I want to just thank those of you who have been watching faithfully. I want to ask you to continue to share these messages with people. We've had some incredible life-changing testimonies of people that have come across this stream that have been, if somebody shared a link with them. So please continue to share it. Be a part of what God is doing through Circle Church. We know that he has great things in store. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next week.